Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'll just get started. Uh, our apologies for the delay, you know, technology and the world of 2021. Um, my name is Nancy Brozick, and I'm the Director of Development and Communications for the North Association. And it is awesome to see you here today. Um, you know, the one thing that I love about the trail is that every encounter brings a story. Um, whether it's a story that I tell myself or a story I share with others, um, every time I step on the trail, there's a story unfolding. Storytelling allows us to share our experiences, to share uh, and to um, recognize the things that we have in common when it comes to our love for the trail and our com it comes to our love for hiking. So today we're honored to welcome the Watershed Journal Literary Group. This grassroots nonprofit lifts the voices of Pennsylvania wilds. Today, Patricia and Jess are going to take us through uh, how that group engages storytelling for the trail in Pennsylvania and how to use our life experiences with sensory language so that we can tell our story. So with that, I turn it over to Patricia. Hope you enjoy. Well, thank you very much for that, Nancy. And hello, everyone. Um, delighted to be here as uh, a representative of the Watershed Journal. Uh, storytelling is in our DNA. It's really the reason why the journal was started and ancillary groups like the Writer's Block Party that are associated with the journal. And, and Jess Weibel holding up uh, the latest copy of the Watershed. Uh, with the pictures of uh, mushrooms, um, something I know a lot of you probably look for while you're hiking. Uh, she, of course, has been a major uh, driver of the journal and the, the writers group, and you'll hear more from her. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Abby, or if you can put up my slide, um, slides, uh, let me talk a little bit about this first 20 minutes or so. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about sensory language in nature poetry. And my hope is that uh, like Nancy was saying, by the end of this 20 minutes or so, you'll be inspired to write about your trail experiences and that you'll tap into the power of sensory language. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about just what that power means. Um, we're talking about three of my favorite things, poetry, the beauty of Northern Appalachia or, or um, Western Pennsylvania and hiking. So if we go to the next slide, um, this, uh, deck is primarily taken from a book that I wrote and published earlier this year. Um, and it's just easier for me to use my own work. You can imagine permissions and everything else being what they are. So the book was san called Sanctity and it's unabashedly a book of nature poetry. Um, and I published it you know, during a very trying time for all of us, all of us, the COVID was in full swing still is, of course. And um, the point of the book was to bring the solace and sanctuary that being in the woods and on the trail can bring. So that's the source of the poetry. So if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to make a comment about, uh, along what Nancy said, how storytelling weaves in with our experiences and how sensory language can be brought to bear as we tell those stories. So this is what happens to me. This poem really um, is, is a perfect example of what happens to me while I'm writing. It's called, How Much More Beautiful. How much more beautiful than the tinny chatter in my head is the wind in the oaks. A dove croons, a junco flits. I walk in beauty, and even my footsteps seem too loud. The vireo scolds me, here I am. The thrush warbles, it is June. The woods say, quiet mind, be still. And I am stunned into peace. This is what happens to me routinely on the trail. And this is the moment I hope you'll feel enticed to capture when you're out in our beautiful woods. So the next slide is um, an important one because I think we should define sensory language. 
it's an academic term and there are others, figurative language, there are devices like metaphor and simile. So just that we all think the same way through the next uh, time together, I, I wanted to define this with you. So we experience the world through our senses, seeing, touching, hearing, smelling, tasting. And those are very powerful avenues of connection. Sensory language deliberately is the deliberate use of words associated with one or more of our senses because that will deepen the engagement your reader has as they read what you wrote, your story. And so it's certainly important in all types of writing, fiction, even nonfiction, uh, even academic fiction. But nature poetry is per particularly enhanced by sensory language. In fact, there are studies that show the brain fires differently when reading sensory language as opposed to the dry discourse of academia. And the, it's interesting, the, the industry that has done the most studying of this is actually advertising. The difference in the way you'll respond to advertising if sensory language is used versus you know, the drier language of, um, of academia or some other other means. So keep that in mind as we go forward. Remember the power of sensory language. So the next slide, let's start with seeing. Um, sight is the power of imagery. Imagery is the visually descriptive language that appeals to the sense of sight. Words related to sight indicate colors, shape, or appearance. For example, gloomy, dazzling, bright, foggy, gigantic, I mean, the list goes on and on. And images can actually become metaphors that further create emotion in the reader. So they're not just descriptive in and of themselves, but they're evocative. And a hike in early morning can become a poem filled with the images of late summer. So at the next slide, I have an example of a poem from Sanctity that is exactly along these lines. It's called The Path. There's a path that runs to the east, the grass grown up from neglect, only the faintest denting from deer moving during the night. On certain days, the drifting sun rises directly there, the light slithering along the weedy heads of seed through the trees, reaching me as I wait like a sacrifice in the temple a line to catch the golden snake or a priestess at Newgrange praying as the solstice sun pierces the passage to anoint the dead. I wait. The trees aflame above, the ground glowing from burnished leaves, the sky growing brighter, the light's shaft coiling, ready to crack open my heart. So in that poem, I used a lot of imagery, a lot of words that, that appeal to the reader's sense of sight. The next slide moves on to the next sense I want to explore with you, and that is the power of texture through touch. When you're hiking, uh, obviously you'll, you know, your sense of sight is, 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 in, is inflamed, as I, as I said in the path. But, but we touch things too. We touch the bark of trees. You know, we may examine a, t a, a mushroom. We may lean over and brush against a, a leaf. We may pick up an acorn from the, the ground. And while we hike with a, a sense of, of, of leave no trace, nev nevertheless, touch is an important part of the experience. Even the wind blowing against your, your arms can be part of this. So, Evoking touch brings your reader into your scene in a deeply intimate way. Touch is probably the most intimate of the senses. And naturally, words that relate to touch describe textures. And you can describe them, use them to describe feelings and abstract concepts too, like gritty. Gritty can be something that feels gritty, but also gritty can be some sense of perseverance or, or strength or courage. Other words like creepy, slimy, fluff, sticky, 
there's a host of words that will immediately engage your reader's sense of touch. So as you scramble over rocks and roots on a trail, you touch the bark of a tree, all of that can be recalled in your scene through the sense of, of touch and using these words. So I wrote a poem, it's on the next slide, called Bouldering. And that's uh, my son and, and uh, nephew and grandnephew there on top of a boulder they had just climbed. This was published in Deep Wild Magazine. Your breath, your heartbeat quicken. The boulder you chose, or did it choose you, fractured by freeze and thaw, tumbled by time to squat here, its crevices waiting. You study its secrets, height and bulge, the mossiness of it, the rootless lichens, the snake-like roots of small trees tangled like lovers. The old pitted sandstone skin you expect will be cold, but is dry, warm, even in shadow. It awaits your hands, ready to caress, to probe, dusted with desire. So that's a poem that uses the sense of touch, you know, a someone about to climb a boulder, they've dusted their hands with chalk, they're about to stick their fingers in those crevices. That, that actually was Bare Town Rocks, by the way. So next, I'm going to move on to the power of mimicry, and that's appealing to the sense of sound. And words related to hearing describe sounds like crashing, thumping, piercing, tingling, squeaky. And often these words mimic sounds. They're onomatopoeic. They, you, the, the, sound, the sound itself is embedded in the word. Of course, when you're hiking, when you're out in nature, the sounds that you can hear are are range from deeply intimate to broad and when you when you broad like the rush of the trees the wind in the trees and when you evoke those words the uh, your experience and the reader's experience become more universal so this isn't anymore just about your hike when you evoke uh, the sound of the leaves in the tree or the song of a bird, that's, that's, a, that's an, a moment that any reader can relate to. So it helps make you the poem far more, um, more relatable. So on the next slide, I chose a poem where I was very deliberately using sound to create a moment, a visceral moment in the reader uh, to bring back the sense of summer in Northern Appalachia. And it's called Appalachian Summer. The slap of a screen door now without glass, a dog panting in the sun with shade a foot away, crickets rubbing legs in long grass, horses gently snorting clover, a robin's warble near its nest, tree branches rustling, the hum of a faraway mower, ice rattling in a pitcher of tea, bare feet thudding on the porch, the squeak of a swing, distant thunder. So that's Appalachian summer, or however you say it, maybe some of you say Appalachian summer. And you can see how in that poem, I used sounds to put the reader right there on the porch and hopefully even feel the heat of the day. Smell is the next um, sensory uh, uh, sense that I'd like to explore. Um, and it's the power of memory. Smells and memory, I think you all know this, are immediately linked. If you walk into a, a, a bakery and smell bread, it might take you right back to your grandmother's kitchen, for example. These are words like aromatic, fetid, fragrant, musty, pungent, and spicy. And sometimes the words related to smell are very similar to words related to taste, which we'll explore in a moment. And of course, together, taste and smell are 
tantamount to what we experience when it comes to food, when it comes to experiencing, you know, the sea or other places or certainly the forest. So what's interesting is um, you can really create a sense of connection with your reader if you bring smell into your poem or your writing, your, your storytelling. There's a strong sense of connection through or a factory writing. And, and this is a sense that is often neglected in poetry uh, because poetry lends itself to visually oriented language. So if you go back and read poems, uh, you'll find that except for food, often food is used, there's not a lot of use of smell in, in, in many poems. But we know there are special smells when we hike the forest. For example, after rain, that smell called petrichor from rain hitting dry soil is, is an English word specifically designed to describe that moment. So the next, um, the poem that I chose for this is called The Waning on the next slide. And this was published in the Watershed Journal. And I don't use smell exclusive uh, extensively but but see you know see what you think lie in the grass as the sun sinks the stars swimming into your ken soft wings of moths brushing your arms the perfume of primroses as the air cools the trees throb with the chant of insects Lie as the dew pearls your face, the buck steps near to graze, the owl calls from a distance. Perseus rises with its dust of comets that spark the night and shame the moon fading above you. You could lie here tonight for all the breadth of time. You, the chanting insects, the dust of comets, the owl, and the waning eternal moon. So in that poem, I talk about the perfume of primroses and I use that phrase because of the you know, alliteration, primrose perfume. And I tried to evoke the smells of the night through that phrase. And uh, I hope you experiment even more with smell uh, when you think about hiking and writing about it. And so that brings us to taste. Um, another one very integral with smell. Um, and I called this parsing neurons because the science behind the way your brain works when you read sensory language talks about the, the strong reaction to reading words about taste. The brain, the tongue, almost create the taste in the mouth of the reader if they have a strong understanding of it, and if you uh, if you use the words that that bring it clearly to mind. So words like bitter, creamy, gingery, luscious, peppery, or on the negative side, nauseating or salty, all of these fire the neurons in the reader's brain associated with taste. And it deepens the reader's connection with that moment. It's one of the most powerful ways to bring your reader into your moment. And food being you know, associated so closely with taste, food is especially powerful because it has cultural and linguistics and physical properties that are, that are so immediate to the reader. Back in grandma's kitchen, back at the Thanksgiving table, uh, back around the campfire, trying uh, having s'mores, um, e eating the you know the dried food that someone's packed for a long through hike. All of these are intensely um, intimate and bring memories flooding back to the reader as they read your story. So I I chose a poem called "The Gift" on the next slide to illustrate a little of this. In this case, sometimes even the name of the food itself, a mushroom, a, a lettuce leaf, can create that sense of taste, um, even if the language you use to describe it is simple. So this is called The Gift. In the woods, cutting sprays for the porch lamps, lit with solstice coming on, the air fresh 
weeks of snow lately gone, in the last few warmer days. My hands sticky, brown with sap and scented with pine. On a whim, I walk to the garden, across the soaked, spongy grass, and there the thyme is lush, and sage, supple, young arugula, ready for an unexpected winter salad. At that moment, I stop and breathe deep in wonder for green things that find shelter under snow to delight me on a day when I expected nothing. And I'm sorry, nothing may be cut off there. So that's the gift. And, and here I'm using taste through the herbs that I mention, the arugula I mention. I don't actually describe them as much as count on them to bring that sense of taste to the reader. So those are the four, the five senses. Um, and I, I wanna stop there and I, on the next slide, I actually have a poem that I didn't write that I'll read in a moment, but let me, let me stop for a moment and ask um, Abby, Nancy, I'm not sure if we're taking questions or how we want to, uh, how we want to do that before I, before I conclude. You're more than welcome to do questions if there's any, and then I can reshow that poem too when you're ready. Yeah. Any questions or comments um, as we did that whirlwind tour <laughs> of sensory language um, and, and those examples? Um, I was just wondering, and I may have missed, you may have said, did you take the photographs that are with your poems? I did. Those are those are my photographs, and those are mostly taken in Cook Forest or in Clear Creek State Park. You know, I it's funny. I moved here nine years ago, and I knew about the Baker Trail because I lived in northern Pittsburgh, and I would come across it. But I knew nothing about the North Country Trail, and I kept driving down Miola Roll and, Road and seeing the trailhead and say what is this North country? I mean, of course I knew about the Appalachian trail. I mean, who doesn't? And I read Bill Bryson's book, you know, but I didn't know anything about North country trail. And we kept seeing the trail and I said, what is this? And when I looked into it, I was amazed to find that there are 4,000 plus miles of trail coming right through Northwestern Pennsylvania. So we started spending some time on the trail and then, um, uh, adding it to our forays. So yes, all these pictures are from the trails around here. Or that's my horse and, you know, <laughs> my garden. <laughs> They're poetic photographs. Thanks. Well, the, you know, our, we're so fortunate because the trails around here and our parks and our, uh, the, you know, and our, the Pennsylvania wilds, they just, it, they just deliver that beauty to us. I just point and click sometimes, you know. <laughs> Any other questions though? Thanks for that. I have a quick question um, or it's, it's just more of a, like a, a thought or a comment. I'm curious what you think about this, that I often feel um, like when I'm out hiking that any photo that I take or any words that I can even find to say wouldn't even come close to the way I feel and what I see. And I was wondering if you ever feel that, um, I do like consider that feeling something that kind of stops me even from like saying anything because it's just like, so like just beautifully simple and overwhelmingly beautiful to be like out there in it. So I was wondering if that ever, you know, you ever have that experience and what you do with those feelings. Yeah, that's, that is a great, great question. Um, you're, you're essentially talking about the humility that we all have to have when approaching, you know, the beauty that we're, we're surrounded with, and also the humility that comes from the fact that not everyone has access to this. Some people never have access to it. I mean, I read somewhere that, you know, folks that live in, in the city, for example, with all the light pollution may never really see the moon the way we see it as a simple example. All I can tell you is to tap into that emotion. That emotion is you. That emotion is real. And so that you can write about. D don't try to describe, you know, the rays through the trees better than anybody ever else has. I mean, that's, you know, there are some, there are people writing nature poetry 
everywhere for good reason. But you are that hiker in that moment and you are having those emotions and that's what you want to tap into. And if you marry that sense of emotion with what you're seeing, your reader will be right there with you. Thank you. Anything else? That's a great question. We're so lucky. Well, let me read this last poem because um, I actually wanted to share that, you know, we're not the only ones who are in love with this area. One of the nature poets that most influences me is Mary Oliver. And she she passed away not long ago. She has a, a, a huge body of work. She has been true to that emotion and connecting nature to the human condition and human emotion for decades. And she actually wrote a poem about the Clarion River. And this is an excerpt. She's actually, I believe, uh, she was from New England, if I recall correctly. So she wasn't from this area, obviously. But I wanted to share this with you because it just shows how, how the beauty of, of our region, uh, Clarion County, and of course the trail goes along the Clarion. The Clarion plays a huge role in the beauty of our area and the ecosystem of our area. It just goes to show how it can impact uh, a visitor. So this is an excerpt from a much longer poem called At the River Clarion by Mary Oliver. I don't know who God is exactly, but I'll tell you this. I was sitting in the river named Clarion on a water-splashed stone, and all afternoon I listened to the voices of the river talking. Whenever the water struck a stone, it had something to say, and the water itself, and even the mosses trailing under the water. And slowly, very slowly, it became clear to me what they were saying, said the river, I am part of holiness. And I too, said the stone, and I too whispered the moss beneath the water. So that's, um, that's the end of, of my presentation. And um, I believe I'm turning it over to Jess, but thank you for your time. And uh, I look forward to hearing about your reading. Maybe you'll submit them to the Watershed Journal, uh, which we would love to see. So thank you again, and I'll turn it over to Jess. Thank you so much for that. It was beautiful to go through. I, I love how you broke down each sense and really the way that the sense connects to the experience, because I think that when we hear about sensory language, we all have an idea of you know the, the senses and, and how um, they can affect the way that we experience things, but, but to really break it down in that way and, and see how we can apply that to, I, I love the question about, um, being able to like, can we really recreate or, or reflect on a moment or do a moment justice when we are in the middle of it. And I think another important part of the practice of writing nature poetry is to be in that moment and not worry. Maybe you don't need to pull out your camera at that moment. Maybe you don't need to write anything down in that moment. Maybe the point is just to be there and to um, just be in the state of kind of hyper awareness and humility and all of these things that you're feeling. And then when you get home later, or maybe the next day, or maybe a couple weeks from now, that moment is still with you and you, you conjure it up again. And then uh, you can put it into words. Then you can, um, in that moment of reflection, really think about what you wanna say about that moment. Um, and, and I love what you said, Patricia, about you know that it starts with you and your experience. And that is where we all are um, experts in our own storytelling. Um, so I wanted to mention a little bit about the Watershed Journal and talk to you all about what we do, uh, offer maybe some opportunities, and then, and then open it up to see um, who among you likes to write. And, um, and we'll talk about all the different ways that you can write poetry versus travel logs versus all of that. Um, but I want this second half just to be really 
interactive for everybody here to talk about some of the ways that you tell stories and relay your experiences when you are in uh, nature. So first of all, um, I'm the executive director for the Watershed Journal Literary Group, which is a 501c3 nonprofit based in what we call the Western Pennsylvania Wilds. So we serve 11 counties in Western Pennsylvania and, um, and we're based in Jefferson County. So um, we started really formulating the group back in 2017. By 2019, we were incorporated officially as a nonprofit organization. But it all really started with the literary magazine and publishing that we did. Um, and I'll show you a couple covers um, just to show you some examples. We didn't, when we set out to do this, we didn't say um, we're specifically looking for nature poetry or we're specifically looking for nature photos. We never said that. But uh, a lot of what we got were was exactly that because, um, and I know my experience moving here about five years ago, uh, when I went hiking, I didn't expect, or just even walking around my house um, outside, I didn't expect that I would so often have the urge to take a picture of what I was seeing or write about what, there's just something about it. And I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, but there's something about, you know, um, this area and and the areas where you know nature is allowed to have a strong foothold, where um, where the beauty just overwhelms you and you have to uh, you have to be a part of it. Uh, you have to be mindful of it and it, and it stays with you. So we have um, a, an addition every quarter and they go seasonally. So uh, this is our most recent winter edition um, and spring. And then um, I showed that this is our uh, most recent summer edition. And our fall window is going to come up. Uh, our submission window will uh, be open within the next couple of weeks. Um, and for those of you who are local to our area, um, you're eligible to submit, we are inclusive. So anyone who submits, we strive to publish in some way, either in print or on our website. Um, and so we take uh, stories, essays, poems, um, fiction, nonfiction, all of that. Uh, and uh, our idea is that inclusivity is the way in which we get the best representation of our region and, um, and the best community building um, for, for who, you know, our literary community. So while other literary magazines really pride themselves on being exclusive and saying, well, only 5% of our submitters get in, or we, we're very much the opposite. We like to brag about the fact that we include everyone and we're interested in a diversity of voices and experiences. Um, so that's the Watershed Journal. And um, for those of you who are not local, but would still be interested in contributing or being a part of it, there's a lot of opportunity for that too. Uh, in fact, we take photographs um, often from submitters outside of our region because we love having a variety of images to work with. Um, Patricia in her book did a beautiful job of pairing pictures that she had taken with poetry that she had written. Um, for the journal, we do that pairing and we really enjoy that aspect of it where we will take a story, let's say, and put something visual with it that might bring out something new that might be unexpected um, or give a fresh take on what the author was intending. Um, so we're really happy with uh, being able to marry the visual element and the written word. Um, and also artwork, we do take original artwork so um, paintings or uh, pictures of sculptures or whatever it is, mosaics. We once had a, a beautiful mosaic on the cover of a magazine. Um, and those can, again, come from outside of our region. The other way into the Watershed Journal um, is if you're outside the region, if let's say you're visiting, um, you take the opportunity to come out here and um, hike around or whatever it is. If you're writing about our region, we're interested in um, publishing what you have to say. Um, so, so that's another way if you're writing directly about our region, taking pictures here, um, all of that is eligible for publication. 
So uh, we do have a membership as well. So we have a lot of people locally or from afar who are really excited about what we're doing um, because it's kind of unlike anything else um, that's happening with literary magazines. Um, so our supporters, and we are a grassroots organization, so I should mention we're not um, supported by university, we're not supported by a big company or anything like that. It's just really just a handful of people who wanted to start something and wanted to um, build community around our sh storytelling and experiences. And so we've been able to support the Watershed Journal and its publishing efforts and grow um, thanks to members, submitters, um, and sponsors, and then uh, also support our bookstore and literary arts center, which we just opened last November. So um, if you are happen, you do happen to be in the neighborhood in Brookville, we are uh, at Watershed Books. That's where I am streaming to you now. And uh, Watershed Books is a bookstore and literary arts center where we sell regional author books um, and really try to create a space where people can engage with that work. And then also we take donations of used books. So we've got an amazing variety of all kinds of things here, but it's uh, kind of the heart of our literary community and a center for everyone to gather. And um, we do events the best we can, both virtual and in-person when we're able to. And, um, you know, like I said, it's all about creating opportunity for people for our mission is empowering readers and readership and authorship. So um, maybe you're a writer, um, or maybe you write things and you haven't quite validated yourself as a writer yet. Or maybe you just really enjoy um, reading beautiful nature poetry like Patricia's or reading stories and travelogues of people's experiences. Um, but at this point, I would love to hear from the participants today and um, to hear about perhaps your experiences with writing, what's your comfort level with writing, and uh, who among you has that impulse that when you are out and about, you know, in a moment that really is overwhelming or beautiful or moving or resonates with you, you have that impulse to put it into the written word and um, keep it with you. Yeah, I would love to uh, start out the discussion with maybe a question uh, for your for the watershed group. Uh, I I'm not a hiker, but my husband was, and I'm finally going through some of his things. He died five years ago, and uh, down in the garage I found a file cabinet, a tall file cabinet, and apparently that was his hiking file cabinet. So. I've been going through some of his things in it and discovered how meticulous he was about all the trails he had hiked and when he did them, and how many miles for each segment, and who he was with. And uh, last night I was reading something he had written uh, afterward about uh, being shot at while he was on the trail. And uh, it was just fascinating reading. So I'm curious whether you you know, I could envision having something called dead man walking where I have all my husband's <laughs> trail hikes, which, and he wrote reams about his hiking. So do you, what would you think about having interesting reading, but not firsthand, but posthumously maybe published by <laughs> somebody? Uh, what's that? How does that stand, stand with you? Yeah, no. with you? We are very much all about supporting people in their publishing journeys. And so that can take a lot of different shapes and a lot of ways. The way that we offer in terms of publishing manuscripts, for example, um, we do a cooperative publishing. We just started this last year where um, we are able to support one book per year. So we do a call for uh, submissions. You submit manuscripts to the Watershed Journal. And, um, and then we have a publishing committee, um, a, a university professor from Clarion University, another from Penn State Du Bois, and then um, a, another local writer and a few people from the Watershed Journal Literary Group. Um, so we get together, we read through the manuscripts, we make our selections. Since we're limited, we can only do one per year in terms of our budget and uh, bandwidth because we are an all volunteer effort. So nobody's getting paid to do anything here, but we just do it because we love it. Um, so, so when that comes out, we choose, and we just now um, made our selection for 2021. 
um, a book that we are really excited about. Uh, so in the preliminary stages of working with the author and securing contracts and all that kind of thing. And uh, then we'll be debuting that. But it is um, something that is uh, open and an opportunity for, again, um, meeting our requirements in terms of the regional aspect and um, all of that. But uh, we hope to do another call for submissions next year, um, probably around late winter time. Uh, so if uh, there's a that's an option to publish through us. Um, but there are lots of options for self-publishing, and we do have a bunch of people who have done that this year um, with the opportunities that we have within the Watershed Journal, but also kind of just that organically happen. So partnerships that take on, somebody says, well, I'll edit your book for you and I'll help you get it on Amazon because self-publishing is remarkably um, doable and accessible these days through Amazon KDP, uh, Kindle Direct Publishing, um, but there are others. And, um, and again, we have people who do as freelance, they'll do editing, um, freelance layout and design. And um, so that's another way to get your story out there, but there's a lot of possibility there for sure. Hey, and Jess, you know, just to add to that though, if, if there was one story that really struck, um, struck her when she was reading her husband's notes, she could submit that to the journal as a standalone essay. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, I, I, we, I think our, you know, limitation is 1500 words. Am I right about right. that, Jess? Yeah, for print. for print. But I'm so glad you said that because if you're not local in particular, our print distribution is hyper local. We don't really, unless you're a member, um, members we mail out. But otherwise, um, we're not in every, you know, Barnes and Noble or anything like that. So, um, but we do publish on our website and there are two ways to do that. One would be online exclusives. So I'm sending something in and this goes for everyone. If you have something that you'd like to send in during our submission window, again, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have it open for the fall. You just go to the watershedjournal.org. Um, that's on our little thing here, watershedjournal.org. And um, you can submit your, uh, your work to us via email. But also we have a blog too. Um, and the blog we publish regularly. So um, if you had something that, again, was a reflection or an essay or, or this found um, story that you want to share with uh, more broadly, the blog is a wonderful way to do that because you can share it online and it, um, it's something that can really transcend our uh, proximity limitations. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Yeah, lots of opportunity and that's, it does sound like a wonderful wealth of uh, storytelling. That you and I'm in Slippery Rock, but Jefferson County, where is, where is, that's not, I, I, you're in Western PA, but not close to Butler County. Where is Jefferson? Yeah, we are um, between like Dubois and Clarion. So it's more of a North okay. uh, Western to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Anyone else who uh, enjoys writing or um, has, um, you know, questions about what we do in particular? Any other writers out there? So let me ask it this way too, since we just have a little bit of time left. Is there um, anyone who feels like uh, maybe I'm not a writer, but I'm interested in ways that I can express the experiences that I'm having in nature through writing? And maybe that does, isn't going to be a book of poetry. Maybe that feels intimidating or out of reach but there are other ways that you're looking for to um, use the written word to remember and reflect. Journaling perhaps, or um, anything like that. Yeah, I, I don't mean to dominate the, the chat no, time no. here, but I, also, I actually do enjoy writing myself, even though I was not a hiker and am not a hiker, but on one of these earlier um, broadcasts during the annual conference, I know it was said the first five minutes are the hardest. And so I've thought, well, maybe I should just go over to Moraine State Park and 
hike for a half an hour or something. And then I might be able to write about my hiking experience. Um, but I do lead a, a book club of my own and uh, I'm in two others. So I love reading. And I've told my clubbers that I would love to be an author someday. And so I have that impulse, as you called it. And um, so I'm always on the lookout for things that I feel or see and, and how I might be able to, to but, but the most I've done so far is make up a title to my book. <laughs> so I have a ways to go. Well, I, the, what I love about what you're um, experiencing there is that, you know, nature and being in nature and um, whether it's a Bill Bryson, like fish out of water type of situation, or whether it's somebody who is, you know, like, for example, uh, we had a first time submitter to the Watershed Journal uh, a few editions ago. And I used to do a podcast where I would interview new submitters and um, it's on our website, uh, Robert Clayson, I think is his name. Um, and you can uh, look up his episode on our website there if, you, if you're interested. But he was just wonderful because um, he is, I think he was a firefighter. Uh, he was in, in a very rural part of like Elk County here. And, um, and he worked outdoors a lot. And he was, he's very much like a, um, a woodsman, you know, a, a nature kind of guy, naturalist. And um, he wrote a poem and submitted, it was called Heartwood to the Watershed Journal. It was just, talk about simply beautiful. It was just a simply beautiful and beautifully simple poem. And, um, and as it turned out, as I interviewed him, I found out that was the first poem that he ever wrote in his life. And he submitted it to the Watershed Journal and saw it, you know, in print and in publication. And it was so gratifying to him to, to see that process and to see that connection that he had with people through publishing that poem. And uh, I don't think he would have called himself a writer. I don't think that he would have known or even really anticipated that that's something that he would ever do in life. But he just had this moment of chopping wood. And, you know, the, the he went actually to a poetry, uh, kind of happened upon this poetry. And Patricia, you'll remember uh, meeting him, I think, um, at that poetry reading. And he was just kind of moved by it. So I would love to, uh, you know, a couple of weeks from now, hear from someone who went to this uh, meeting today and heard Patricia's work and thought, oh, you know, later uh, being outside or on a hike or whatever, um, the moment of, yeah, I can do this. This is something that uh, it's for me too. It's not just for those poets over there. It's for me to be able to share my experience with the world. I'd love to hear from one of you um, that you wrote your very first poem maybe uh, in a moment like that. Yeah, Jess, I'll also add, if I may, uh, to anyone who's thinking about um, writing more, look for writers groups, people who meet and encourage one another, read their work and get feedback. There are writer workshops. We give a workshop um, every quarter in Brookville, Pennsylvania, which may be too far for someone from Slippery Rock, but we've also done some things um, uh, through Zoom or, or virtually like this. So. Uh, you know, meeting other people who are writing, uh, you know, just really help inspire, can really help inspire you and embolden you and, and you know, helps you realize that it is, it's, it's not something you need, a, you know, you need any special uh, dispensation to do. And if you're a, if you're a, a reader, huh, that's so important. You know, every time you read, you're informing your your own vocabulary and your own sense of our language and and how it's used by different writers. So so I really encourage you to look for a writers group, uh, look for some workshops. Um, as as I said, we do give workshops in Brookville, Pennsylvania. They are free uh, and open to the public. Uh, you just have to watch our event page to see when our next uh, workshop might be and look for ways that you can build a community around you to support you as a writer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the final thing that I'll mention, because I know we're running out of time here, is if you are looking to kind of uh, dip your toe in the literary uh, pool of um, 
my metaphor is running thin there, but if you want to try out some poetry or try out some nature poetry, I would recommend starting, I love the haiku form. And a lot of people feel very much like they can wrap themselves around something very simple like that. So the haiku form is five, seven, five. So that's your syllable count. Um, so five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the next and five syllables. And so it's only three lines of poetry. A symbol is every vowel sound. And, um, you know, you can look at all different kinds of um, examples of haikus. I mean, they're everywhere. But um, I would say that that would be, uh, I was just speaking from experience. It's a great way to start your day. You know, <laughs> like you wake up in the morning, you have your cup of tea or whatever it is. And just in that moment of like pre-dawn light and you're, thinking about, you know, clearing your brain and, and trying to um, kind of prepare yourself for the day to reflect on a moment that you had, maybe it's outside or maybe it's in your yard or maybe it's over with the chickens or the horses or whatever it is, but to um, just try to write three lines, five, seven, five, where, um, you know, you distill that experience into just as few words as possible, but as descriptive as possible. And um, it's just a great way to get started, I think. Um, so I want to thank Abby and Nancy for having us here. Um, this is a wonderful initiative that you guys are doing. And I know that you've hit some bumps in the road as, as we all have with planning events, but I think you've done an incredible job still bringing people together. And uh, that's what it's all about. So thank you for doing what you do. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jess and Patricia. We greatly appreciate it. Like I said, I'm not um, an avid writer, but I'm kind of, after hearing that, I kind of feel like I I, I wrote down the 575. <laughs> so I can, <laughs> I can take that to practice um, and see. I mean, you never know. Maybe I'll be submitting something too um, to the journal. We'll see. So I, I greatly appreciate this uh, presentation and uh, thank you for everyone for taking time out on your Sunday as well. Um, again, everything we do is recorded. So um, if you know someone that missed it and want to see it, it's going to be on the North Country Trails website. Um, and then again, tomorrow we have another event as well, because celebration is still going till uh, this Wednesday, the 18th. But tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, we have the Hiker Stories panel. Um, so we hope that you can come and join us for that event as well at 1 p.m. Eastern. So but thank you again uh, for taking the time out of your day and enlightening us on everything. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Thank weekend. You, take care. <laughs>